Good morning, HCC. We are in lockdown once again. But don't worry, because every Sunday morning, we are here. We're back to services online. We're no longer doing live services from the centre. We're back to pre-recording our services, and there will always be a service for you, as well as your small groups, as well as being able to text and encourage each other, as well as being able to go for a walk with somebody else outside. Please stay in touch. Please don't lock yourself away, but still connect with us. Oh, he Helen, what are you doing up there? So today we're carrying on with session five on the prayer course, which is unanswered prayer. And normally I'd be down there at Hinchy Brook Park to greet you, but we're not able to do that today. But I have sent out two sheets, one for adults with some prayer and reflection questions on it, and one for families with some questions and activities to do outside. So you can also engage in thinking about unanswered prayer through these outside activities. But next we're going to think about how in whatever's happening, God is there, he is our strength. And we'll be singing the joy of the Lord is our strength. And after that, we'll be joining Trevor for a time of remembrance. Well, as Rich said in the introduction to the service, today is Remembrance Day and as we do every year in HCC, we just want to take a few moments to stop and pay our respects to 
to those who gave their lives and those who were injured in conflicts for this nation and other nations across the world. Now some of you will know that I spent my working life in the Air Force. Uh, I was an engineer, so I wasn't involved in any conflict myself, um, but I did meet up with people who were prepared to give their lives in execution of their duties. Um, and I worked with them, and I worked on the te technology uh, that they would have used for that. So, I have been around that environment, and what impact does that have? It probably brings it closer to home, slightly closer to home. It probably makes it a little bit more meaningful. And at this time, I just tend to let my thoughts run to gratefulness to God, because we go to God first of all, gratefulness to Him for these people who gave their lives for this country in wars across the globe over decades now. The two world wars, the Gulf Wars, and elsewhere, Northern Ireland, and even today in various locations. People who caught, are caught between it being a job and a duty and that desire to serve and being prepared to give the ultimate sacrifice. But it's not just for those who were killed on the battlefield that we remember today, but it's those who were injured and maybe are living with the scars of those injuries even now and for their families because they are all part of this sacrifice. So, will you join me in just pausing for one minute to give thanks to God and give thanks for the circumstances under which hundreds of thousands of people have given their lives in service of this country. And in doing so, we also remember those of other nations, some of whom we may have fought against, and we remember the sacrifice that they had to make. We remember them as well today. So join me as we just pause and reflect for one minute. So the theme of this week's session is all about unanswered prayer. Now this machine I'm about to go on now is one that I've used before as an illustration. And it's, it's a machine which is used for stretching out your back. And what you do is you just tip backwards ah, and stretch your back out. Now, it can seem like sometimes when we're going through desperate situations that we're just left hanging there and God does not seem to be hearing us or answering us even though it's a desperate situation for us. Now the first time I used this, I went right over and then I realised I could not get up again and I was shouting, help, help! And it was getting quite desperate and no one was seeming to be hearing me. I was right like this and then, <laughs> and then, I, <laughs> then I couldn't get back up and I <laughs> couldn't get back up again. <sighs> oh. So perhaps you have felt like this and you just do not understand, woohoo, head rush, where God is at. So today's session is all about this. Where is God when our prayers do not seem to be heard? So let's listen to what he has to say.
So Pete, here we are, four sessions in to the prayer course. We've talked just over these sessions about a lot of great stories of answered prayers, uh -huh. but the truth is that it's not always that simple, is it? It's certainly not. Prayer is the most wonderful thing in the world in many ways, but I think we've got to be honest that sometimes it's also the most painful thing. I think one of the things that I appreciate so much about you is that you're not afraid to talk about that. In fact, one of my favorite books that you've written is a book on unanswered prayer, and that's God on Mute. Um, and I think you probably wrote that at a time when people were wanting you to write more books about miracles, right? Yeah, they really were. They were, they were wanting me to be the guy who just tells everyone that prayer always works. Right. And actually, I felt I had to be honest about the fact that, yes, prayer does work, and, and, and there really are miracles, but also that it doesn't always work the way that we need it to or want it to, and it can be incredibly painful. And that comes out of my own personal experience. But, you know, even just recently, a friend of mine, Tom, um, has just died, and I'm right now, if I'm honest, still processing that. As a Christian, asking God, what went on. He died so suddenly, 15 weeks after diagnosis, aged just 40. He left behind a beautiful wife, two amazing young daughters. And we prayed and we prayed and it simply didn't work. And it's devastating. Now, I, I, I don't know why God didn't heal him. Mm. But I do know this, at his memorial service, there were tears, we all wept, but there was also great hope because he knew Jesus and we know Jesus. And so it, this is the paradox of faith, right? Um, some people will know that that's the story in many ways of the 24 seven prayer movement. I think the, probably the first 18 months, we felt like we had cracked the revival code and <laughs> like we'd worked out, if we just pray in this way, we're gonna see the kingdom come. And then for me, that was when my wife got very, very sick mm. and very nearly died on numerous occasions. I've talked about it elsewhere, I talk about it in the book. And, and watching her slipping into epileptic fits again and again and again, the face you love more than any other. And she has a very dangerous kind of epilepsy. It means she has to get into hospital. Um, and I prayed, of course I did. I cried out to God with every fiber of my being and almost every time it's not worked. Mm. I mean, weirdly, a couple of times it has, but hundreds of times it hasn't. And so then you have to process, like she's coming around in hospital the next morning and it's not just the pain and the logistics and the emotion, but it's, God, where were you? And so I'd moved from this position of thinking that our prayers could save the world yeah. to wondering whether they could even save my own wife. And we, we've just got to be honest about all of that stuff, I mm. believe. That's really just so moving, Pete, and I, I appreciate your honesty so much. I think this is something that hangs in your house. Right, well, in our bedroom, actually. When, uh, when we were just getting through some of the worst of Sammy's illness, someone gave us this beautiful piece of art and it's, it's Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And that hangs uh, in our bedroom, facing our bed, um, and has done ever since, wherever we've lived. It's such a promise that, yes, there is nighttime, yes, there is weeping, especially for Christians, but we believe in the morning. We believe in the resurrection that comes after the death. Mm. So even for my friend Tom, there's weeping and there's a sense of darkness, but we know the third day comes. We know we'll see him again. We, we know joy cometh in the morning. That's the Christian paradox. Complete realism about the tears and the darkness of life, but also about the hope of dawn and the joy to come. Mm. But I suppose there are gonna be some people that are gonna say that just by talking about unanswered prayer, uh, we're decreasing faith, that it's right. kind of counterproductive. Yeah. I feel really strongly about this because actually the Bible is so much more honest about unanswered prayer than the church is. Mm. About half the Psalms, maybe a bit more, aren't happy clappy, they are bitter lament. It's blues guitar, not nice happy music. And the word Israel means the struggle. So we are part of a faith that's all about wrestling. And Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have 
trouble and we we don't put a nice filter on that on instagram you know yeah it's, no. <laughs> it's one of those ones we we kind of avoid and then talking of jesus he himself lives with unanswered prayer to this day because he prayed that his church would be united and the last time i checked that that's not happened yeah. the church is bitterly divided so if jesus himself is living with unanswered prayer right now in heaven and if the Bible can be that honest about unanswered prayer, then it's high time that we worked harder to create cultures of honesty in the church. And I don't believe that that is unbelief. I think that's actually a form of belief. If you don't believe in God, then when your prayers don't get answered, you just say, well, it's because it's not true. Mm. But you ask the question, why didn't God answer? Because you believe in him because you trust him, because you know he's real, because you know that he's loving. So it really is a form of faith to wrestle with these kind of things. It's not unbelief. But still, you know, even in the midst of that, and even when we admit it, it's still very difficult to understand, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it really is. And I think this is where it is so profoundly meaningful for Christians, that we believe in a God who came and suffered with us mm. on the cross. In fact, I think if it wasn't for the cross, I don't, I don't think any of the rest of the Christian message would make any sense at all. It's this truth that at the crossroads of all human experience is a God who suffers. And there is such empathy and wisdom in that story. I'd like us to look at it now, actually, if that's yeah. all right. This is Mark chapter 14. And we're going to look at verses 32 to 36. It's the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus is in great turmoil as he prepares for the cross. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Mm -hmm. He took Peter, James and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Mm. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So much in, in that passage that I think can really help us when we are struggling with unanswered prayer. The first thing is notice how vulnerable Jesus is with his friends. We're told that he's overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death. And yet he very intentionally takes Peter, James and John, his three best friends with him into his place of grief and asks them for their support. You've probably experienced this, I know I have. When you really suffer, there's such temptation to hide and yeah. to isolate yourself yes. away. And Jesus, does the opposite. He includes his friends and he knows he needs their help more than ever. And then the next thing to note is that in Jesus' hour of greatest need, he pursued prayer. He knew that his friends were important, but that his father's presence was the, the real great need of his soul. One word from the father can bring more comfort than a thousand from just some human mate. And then notice what Jesus prays. Uh, it's amazing that this vulnerable prayer is recorded for us in detail, probably because the, the three, three friends, Peter, James and John, overheard it and, and, and went into the Gospels. But first of all, Jesus says, Abba, Father. So when he's hurting, he anchors himself in the love of God. Mm. He doesn't say, oh, if you really cared for me, you wouldn't make me go through this. Right. He doesn't question God's love. God's love isn't up for debate. And then he continues, he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. So having affirmed God's love, he affirms God's power. In my own life, I know that when I'm scared, when I'm suffering, when I'm hurting, there is a temptation to question God's love. Do you really love me? You know, why am I suffering? But the other one is sometimes to question God's power, is to downgrade God's mm. power and say, well, I guess this is just too difficult for you, or you can't do that. And Jesus doesn't do that. There's an old Hebrew saying that says, God is not a kindly old uncle. 
he's an earthquake. Mm. And I think what Love that, that. Yeah, it's good, <laughs> isn't it? Because there's problems, in, I'm sure, in, in your life like mine that a kindly old uncle can only smile at. Right. But an earthquake maybe could shake it. Yeah. So affirm God's love and God's power. And then the next phrase in the prayer is one of the most surprising bits of the whole Bible. Because Jesus says, take this cup from me. In other words, Jesus is saying, I don't want to die. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be the guy on a thousand stained glass windows on the cross. Jesus is praying unbiblically. He's gone off message, off piste. It's radical honesty and vulnerability. And it is essential that we are honest when we are hurting and scared and suffering. And Jesus shows us the way to do that, to be honest with our friends and to be honest with God himself. Yeah. This is so helpful, Pete. But is it okay if I ask you a tough question? Of course. So you said that God is our Abba Father, right? He's all loving yeah. and that everything is possible for him, which means he's all powerful. A lot of people are gonna be thinking right now, if God is all loving, right. if he's all powerful, yeah. then why doesn't he stop people from suffering? Okay, so you do know you've probably just asked the hardest theological question of them all. <laughs> the theologians call it theodicy and that there aren't many easy answers. But I have found it helpful to think in terms of three things, God's world, God's war, and God's will. So first of all, God's world. Some prayers aren't answered because it's just the way that God's made the world to work. Mm -hmm. And Christians aren't immune from the laws of nature, the laws of science. Um, for example, on our wedding day, it poured with rain. It wasn't exactly what Sammy and I had been dreaming of. But actually, if every single couple who prayed for a sunny wedding day got it, there'd be drought in, in the land. There must be some farmer somewhere who was praying for it to rain. So there's just laws that make the world work for the vast majority of people, the vast majority of time. And um, we're part of that system. And C.S. Lewis talks about this. He says that God can and does on occasions modify the behavior of matter and produce what we call miracles is part of Christian faith. But the very concept of a common and therefore stable world demands that these occasions should be extremely rare. If God just does miracles all the time, the world's not going to work. Okay, I got that. So I drop a brick on my toe, but it doesn't float just because God loves me. Exactly. And then there's the next one. So that's God's world. The next one is God's war. Uh, the Bible teaches, and most people on earth believe, that we are in a spiritual battle. There is a vicious enemy. And as Christians, we are often targeted. And therefore, some prayers aren't answered because there is an enemy. Satan is actively and successfully opposing the will of God. And it can hurt quite literally like hell. And we are going to look at this in a whole session of its own on spiritual warfare in the final session of this course. Okay, but I kind of have like a million questions right now. Yeah, I get that. I know. I promise we will come on to those. Can we, can we just park the I guess so. spiritual warfare I guess thing so. for a minute? Okay, <laughs> so we had God's world, God's war, uh, and then there's God's will. The third reason for unanswered prayer is not the laws of nature opposing our prayers, and not Satan opposing them, but sometimes it's God mm. who is opposing our prayers, who's saying no to them. And that can be relatively straightforward, actually, sometimes, just because God knows best. And in his love, he says no, and then we look back and we realise why. Like, I'm really glad that many of my prayers haven't been answered. Otherwise, I'd probably have grown up to marry a Spice Girl <laughs> and to work in a zoo. That was my uh, dream in my teenage years. But obviously, there are other prayers that God says no to that we just don't understand. And I've just talked about my own grief right now, processing my friend Tom's death. And that's one of those things I just have to choose to trust even though I don't understand. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about Jesus promising us trouble, and I think we'd all say that we've definitely experienced that. But have you got any practical advice for us? I think right. we all have those times when we just feel like God is a million miles away. We're praying, but it feels like our prayers are just bouncing against the ceiling. Yeah, well, I think it's really important to remember, first of all, that God's silence isn't the same as God's absence. Mm. Don't confuse those two. Just because your prayers aren't working, 
or, or maybe God seems distant, it doesn't actually mean that he's far away because he's actually promised in the Bible, I will never leave you, Poppy. I will never forsake you. Often, like with new Christians, it's like we can see God, we can feel him. It's like super easy. And then there come seasons in our life where we can't see him the way we once did. We can't feel him. We can't hear him the way we once did. Yeah. And it's not that he's abandoned us. It's that he's trying to mature us into mm. something new. He's present, but he's allowing us to kind of grow into new maturity. Mm. I think it was uh, St. John of the Cross that talked about the dark night of the soul. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Those are times when God seems to withdraw from us and immerses us in spiritual darkness. And yet those are oftentimes of great spiritual growth and faith. Mm. There's like a bloody mindedness to true, true Christian discipleship. Uh, you see it in many of the great biblical heroes. One of my favorite examples is Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, you know, the story of Daniel, the lion's den and all that. And th there's this humorous moment, really, where Nebuchadnezzar says, like, if you don't bow down to my idols, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And they say to him, the God we follow can save us and will save us from your fire, O king. So that's real faith. It's yeah. like this defiant exactly. statement, right? And then they go, but even if he doesn't save us, we still won't bow down. <laughs> so what is that? I think what that is, is faithfulness, mm. right? Faith is, I trust God. He can do it. He can do miracles. He can answer my prayers. Faithfulness is, but even if he doesn't, I'm still going to follow and trust. And it's like when our prayers don't work and we're still true, our faith fills up. It becomes full, full faithfulness. It's like faith is God's gift to us and a faithfulness is our gift back to God. It's, it's those times when our prayers don't work and we're still true to him. Yeah. That is actually when we grow in character. Mm. So Poppy, do you know, I bet I bet you know some old man, old woman who's like been a Christian for years, gone through really hard times, mm. but they just have this amazing trust and joy in yes, life. Yes, absolutely. Right? And those are the people we all want to grow up and be like. And their, their story is never, I've had an easy life. It's always, I've had a hard life, but I've learned to trust God. Mm. And they often have this real simplicity. It's that bloody mindedness, it's that faithfulness, that's the filling up of, uh, uh, of faith. And uh, it, it's been true to God even when it doesn't make sense. If, if our prayers were always answered, then faith is just a logical thing to do. But when it doesn't seem sensible, when our prayers aren't working but we're still true, that's faithfulness. Mm. I, I think though that's really challenging though, right? And also maybe a little exciting, right? Because it yeah. feels like there's an objective, like there's some place that God is trying to take us. Yeah, exactly. The, the Apostle Paul says this amazing thing. He says that we can glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, mm. perseverance, character, and character, hope. And then he says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. Isn't that beautiful? So good. Even in the middle of suffering, we can know the hope that comes from God's love. And, and we always want God to airlift us out of our problems, right? That's a miracle, that's yes, an answer prayer. Yes, please Lord. Right, <laughs> and sometimes he does it. Yeah. But more often he parachutes in and he joins us in the midst of the trouble and, and the problem. That's been my experience definitely with Sammy's illness. Mm. He's often come very close to us in sometimes the scariest times. And so I'm learning to ask the question of God, where, not why. Mm. I find when I say to God, why did this happen? Why? He doesn't really answer me very much. But when I say, where are you in this situation? He always answers. Mm. And when we, when we come to God with that question, where are you? We start to experience his presence even when we're going through hard times and disappointment. Yeah, that's, that's really, really so helpful. Where, not why. Yeah. Parachutes, not airlifts. Right. Uh, God's world, God's war, and God's will. Mm -hmm. Faith and faithfulness. And you know, there's this one last little thing. 
that helps link together both our understanding of God's will and Christ's prayer in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he utters that great prayer of, of relinquishment, where he says at the end, not my will, but your will be done. And that's the hardest prayer anyone can ever pray. When we're in those situations and we're scared and we're hurting and mm. God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers the way we want or maybe even need, and we come to that place of saying, not my will but yours be done. It's a prayer of relinquishment. It's a dark kind of trust. You know, every fibre of your being wants God to just parachute in and rescue you. But you, you, but you just say, I'm going to trust you regardless. When Sammy went into the MRI scanner, completely alone, couldn't even take her wedding ring in, um, she was so scared that she just puked everywhere. And then it's like, how do you prepare as a Christian? How do you prepare to go back into that? That's the valley of the shadow of death for, right, for, for, for her. her yeah. right. And what she did was she memorized Psalm 91. It's quite a long Psalm, but it's all about God being with us and his promise of hope and life. And so they, 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 you know, when they put you into the, the tube, they say, do you want the radio on? Trust me, when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, you do not want like Britney Spears in there with you. Right. right? <laughs> so she instead, she just recited Psalm 91 mm. and she came out of that and she said, P, I experienced the presence of God in there with me. I didn't feel alone, even there. You couldn't be there, but he was there with me. And that's the good news that we have in Jesus, that he is with us always. His silence, remember, is not his absence. And even when we don't understand, we can still trust. Mm, that's so, so good. I feel like this episode is, is really important. It's really important to acknowledge that there are people out there right now who are just hurting. I hope that this session has given people some answers in their heads, mm. like some of the questions. It's yeah. important to think about that stuff. But the most important thing is that people find some of God's presence in their hearts and their, people are going through a really hard times. So as we finish with this prayer, Let's do that. Let's pray the actual prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. And I'm aware that for some people watching this, this is, this is a darker kind of trust. Yeah. But yeah, let's pray. Let's do it. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you, God. I thank you so much, God, that you love me so deeply, especially when I'm hurting, and that you have the power to answer my prayers. God, there's so many times that I want to pray this prayer, take this cup from me. I don't want to suffer. But God, not my will, but your will. I trust you, God, even when I don't understand. Give me faith, and God, teach me to be faithful. Amen. So welcome back. I hope you found that um, a helpful and and well, just encouraging session because it was so honest, it was so real. I love the way that he um, really looked into some very deep situations for him. What did you think about it? Yeah, I really like the bit where he talks about that often God doesn't airlift us out of situations. He parachutes in with all that we need to be with us in those situations. And that often the best thing to ask is not the why, but the where are you God? And I remember when I was 21, coming home, I was living by myself after a youth session, going into my house and just sensing something was wrong. And actually somebody had broken into my house and was still in there. And um, it, it was all fine later on, but it left me with a lot of fear and anxiety for a couple of years afterwards. I'd still get really frightened at night. And I was talking to a Christian friend about this and she did exactly what he was saying. She was saying, let's stop and pray through that situation and actually say, Jesus, where were you there? And as I prayed, I got such a strong sense of him saying, I was right there with my arm around you, protecting you. And just thinking actually, whatever we're in, knowing that God is there and just looking for him, I found really powerful. I was quite struck by this whole idea of faithfulness. Mm. And actually, um, faithfulness is, is when it doesn't appear 
that God is there and we still trust in him and we still believe that he is a loving God, that he is an all-powerful God, and that he is with us, it's then that we get filled up in our faith. It's then that we mature and grow in our faith. Um, and I just, I just like that idea that there's, there's something about our faith being built up and God, God working in and through us even as we're in those dark situations. And I love the idea, I love how he shared in the garden when Jesus was in a really difficult mm. situation to remind himself of true promises. He said, Abba Father, didn't he? Yeah. And he goes, You love me, your you love, love me. your power. And then he and just, then the honesty, yeah. yeah, and then just affirmed that God's power in that. So if you're facing hard situations, if you're in a difficult place, remember as you pray, just pray the promises that we have in Jesus, that he and his Father is all loving is all powerful and he is with you he is with you always um do you want to just yeah. lead us in the lord's prayer yeah i will do um and i just wanted to add that my friend encouraged me let's encourage each other to be people of a faithful yeah let's get in touch with each other and reach out when be honest with each other too but let's just pause because jesus is the same yesterday today and forever therefore the prayer that he prayed is still completely relevant and needed by us today so we pray our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. We're now going to join uh, the worship band as they lead us in the song, I'll raise a hallelujah, just raising God up even in the difficult times and remembering who he is. So let's join together in praise. Yeah. 
So thank you for joining us today. Uh, that's it for the service. Um, but just as we close, I'd just like to close with a prayer. It's by St. Ignatius of Loyola. And it says this, O Christ Jesus, when all is darkness and we feel our weakness and helplessness, give us the sense of your presence, your love and your strength. Help us to have perfect trust in your protecting love and strengthening power so that nothing may frighten or worry us. For living close to you, we shall see your hand, your purpose, your will through all things. Amen. Have a great week. Um, and uh, there's a Zoom group meeting now if you'd like to join in. And there are your small groups we're meeting throughout this week. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.